Well, we want to thank the Children's Choir for getting us started this morning. Weren't they a blessing? We want to extend a welcome to you as well. We are so glad you are with us this morning. Uh, there are a number of announcements that are in your bulletin. You'll see them on our uh, slides on the, the uh, uh, screen at the end of the service as well. Please note those. A lot of things going on right now. Uh, one of the things that is going on right now, of course, is our offering for state missions, the Janie Chapman offering for state missions. We've set a goal for $3,500 for that. And this morning we want to show you just a, a brief uh, video that tells you a little bit about where that money goes and what we're going to be doing with some of that through the Janie Chapman offering for state missions. Yes 
South Carolina Baptists are involved in a partnership in Detroit, uh, planning churches and extending the uh, evangelical witness of Christ through that city uh, and throughout the Northeast. So your gifts to Janie Chapman help sponsor partnerships like that. And we encourage you to give generously to support uh, Janie Chapman. Like I said, $3,500 is our goal this year, and uh, I hope that you'll give generously. If you would like to give, either place your offering in one of the special envelopes that's provided, or you can write a check and write on the check for uh, missions, and we'll make sure during this month that it gets to the right place, or you can write Janie Chapman on your check, and we'll make sure it gets there. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on our time of worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for the privilege we have of being a part of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world, across this country, and across our state. Lord, we ask that you would visit your people this morning in this place in a special and intensive manner, that we might experience the presence of Jesus Christ in just a palpable sense. The Lord, that we would uh, recognize who you are. You are the almighty, glorious God who has created us and provided for us. And that we recognize who we are, Lord. We are sinners before you in need of grace and mercy and forgiveness. We ask, Lord, if there's any here that does not know Christ, that they would seek Christ as their Savior this morning, that today might be their day of salvation. And for those of us who know Christ, we ask, Lord, that you would draw us to repentance from our sin, a greater devotion to you, and a, a deeper sense of your presence in our lives. We ask, Lord, that you would move in power this morning, that you would be lifted up and glorified in everything that is done. To your glory and praise and honor, we pray these things and dedicate this service. In Jesus' name, amen. ask you to stand with us this morning as we sing our first song, Majesty. May we stand and sing. Jesus who died, King of all kings. Jesus who died. Amen. Greet each other this morning in the name of the Lord.
said. This morning is prayer time. We come and gosh, that's a good song. Praise in my Savior all the day long. We have so many things to be thankful for, so many things to praise God for. And uh, as we come at this time, uh, let's do remember Terry Borgsalty, uh mother passed away this week. Remember that family. Um, we have others that uh, church related to us, uh, Fortescue family. Uh, they lost a member of their family that this, this week. I think it's 80, 80 Fortescue passed away. They have some uh, connections with our church. Uh, we have others that have been in the hospital that are out. Uh, many people are, are coming up with uh, tests and procedures that will be going on. We have some that are not here this morning because of sickness. And let's lift these up in, in our prayers. And those that want to, to come forward. And as I pray audibly, uh, just pray in your heart. Uh, just speak to God and let him speak to you as to what, what he has for you. Uh, we're starting a new church here. And, uh, man, we ought to be enthusiastic about that. And I hope we are enthusiastic. But let's, let's bow for a word of prayer now. Heavenly Father, God, we, we come to you just thanking you for the blessings you've given us. And, God, just for the opportunity to come together and, and worship this morning. And, and, Father, you know that these people that are here are not here by um, anything except your divine will. Father, it's not my mistake that they're here. I pray, Heavenly Father, you speak to them and touch them. And Father, I, I, I lift those up that's in our congregation that are homesick, that are unable to come here. I ask God that you bless them. I, and Father, just touch them. Father, there's ones that's going to have to be having tests and surgeries and uh, results of tests. And, and I pray, Lord God, that you just... Uh, be with those, and Father, just bless them in a special way. And Father, be with the doctors and nurses if, as they study and as they um, do the tests, and, and Father, give the results. And Father, for, for those families in our community and our church home that have, have lost loved ones, I, I lift them up especially. I pray, God, that you could give them that peace that only you give at this time. And, and Lord, we thank you for that peace and that joy that we have. And and Lord, I, I, I pray for each person in, in our service. I, I lift them up to you, asking God you uh, touch their individual needs. Father, I know there's so many needs and maybe finances, maybe marriages, maybe uh, difficulties with, with situations in their lives. Uh, so many things that could be affecting people. And I pray, Lord, that you help them just to to just get rid, get rid of that right now and, and for this next few minutes. Just be attentive to what you have for them to, to hear. And I pray for our pastor. I ask God you bless him, bless Doug and Alan as they, as they lead us. And I pray, Heavenly Father, you touch them. And Father, we want to lift our soldiers up. We want to lift our military personnel, asking God that you bless them. Thank you, God, for their service. Thank you for their uh, willingness to to put their lives on the lines that we might have freedom. And Lord, along with that, I lift our, our nation up to you, asking God that you just, uh, uh, Father, just be merciful to us as a nation. Lord, we, we've we gone so far down, and I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that uh, you be with those leaders. And uh, Father, as this upcoming election, Lord, we don't know the, the results of it. We don't know it, what's going to be good, what's going to be bad. But Father... We just ask, Lord, that your will be done. And, and knowing, God, that you're in control. And one day, no matter what happens here on this earth, if we're your children, it's going to be okay. And, Lord, we thank you for that. And I pray, Heavenly Father, if there's one here this morning that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, God, that you would, you would save them. Father, if they're far from you, if they're slidden back, back and not living, the way you want them to live, I pray, Lord, that you touch them, speak to them, encourage them, God, that they might become more involved. Lord, we just give this service over to you, and I pray for my pastor. I ask God that you bless him, encourage him, give him the words that we have for this hour. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 322, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. May we stand as we sing the first, second, and last verse.
All those who would like to give to a new CD player. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep away. 
Thank you, choir. What a wonderful job they did. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 22 this morning. 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings is in the Old Testament. And uh, we are going through this wonderful book of 1 Kings, and we're looking specifically at a prophet by the name of Elijah and his interactions with an evil king named Ahab. And the theme of our study has been being a man or woman of God in a spiritually dry place. And there's no doubt that we are living in a spiritually dry land in our day and time, a land that is not only uh, increasingly post-Christian, but increasingly hostile to Christianity. This morning we're going to talk about Ahab, but we're going to, we're going to leave out Elijah for just a little while. We're going to look at a different prophet this morning. There was a prophet by the name of Micaiah, who's going to encounter Ahab this morning. And as we look at Ahab and his encounter with Micaiah, we're going to talk about this idea of, of how we are to approach the world around us. Are we called to be friends with everybody? Are we called to go along so we can get along? 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 1. Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth and Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up. For the Lord will deliver, in, deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, inspired, and inerrant word. We thank you for the truths contained therein. And we ask, Lord, that you would guide and direct us through it, that you would give us strength, encouragement, boldness, and courage as we face a world that is increasingly hostile to your word, help us to stand for truth, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I was reading this week about a study that was done at the University of Leeds in England back in 2008. It's a really interesting study. They got a bunch of people, and they, uh, they brought them into a, a big hall, a very large room, and they put all the people in the, in the room. But before they did that, they told them two things. They said, first of all, you mill around... Uh, do whatever you want, but, but do not talk to each other. You can't talk to each other at all. Now, a, a small group of the people, they took aside and they told them, we want you to walk around the room in a certain pattern. And they gave them this pattern they had to follow around the room. And they put everybody in the room. And what they found was that eventually, the people who had not been told what to do, had not been told where they were supposed to go, began to follow the ones who were walking in a pattern. And in fact, what they found out was that if you had as many as 5% of the group knew where they were going, the other 95% would follow them exactly <laughs> everywhere they went because they seemed to know what they were doing. Now, now scientists have a, a word for that. It's called peer pressure. And the truth is we all fall to peer pressure. I mean, we see it all around us all the time. We, 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 we uh, submit to peer pressure in school. We submit to peer pressure uh, in, in business, in, in work life. When you're out on the interstate highway, let me ask you, how many of you drive the speed that everybody else pretty much is driving? Most of us do. But it's peer pressure. It's because everybody else is going that speed. I, I'll be safe if I go with them too. So we, we go along the same speed. Folks, peer pressure is... Is, uh, it is abundant, it is everywhere, and it tends to guide and direct much of what we do. It, it determines what the world expects of us. The problem with that, though, is that Christians are not supposed to be like the world. We're supposed to be different from the world. 
The world may be walking in a certain pattern through this, this, uh, this world, but let me tell you, folks, we are called to walk in a different pattern. We're called to drive a different speed, so to speak. We are not to be conformed to this world. We are to be different. And even if the world looks at us as failures, as long as God sees us as a success, that's all that really matters. Most of us have heard of Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie had a book, and of course, many years ago, it was called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it was a pretty good course if you want to win friends and influence people. But let me just say, folks, we're not always called to win friends. We're not always called to be friends with the world. The truth we need to see this morning is that there are many great men and women in the Bible who were called to speak the truth even though it didn't win them any friends. I think about the prophet Jeremiah who was tossed into the miry mud in a well and he sank up and sank down in this miry mud. He didn't make a lot of friends. Think about Elijah who we've been talking about for the last month or so. We've been talking about Elijah. Elijah at one point sat down and he wept and cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, take my life. I'm the only one left that stands for you. Didn't have any friends. Think about Jesus. Now, Jesus was the friend of sinners. But I remind you that when he was tried and crucified, just about every one of his friends abandoned him. Sometimes the will of God is that we lose friends. Or rather, those that we would consider friends. Because when you stand for truth, you will find who your real friends are. The first thing I want to note this morning is that as we talk about friends, the Bible teaches that friendships are desirable. I'm not saying we shouldn't make friends. Ecclesiastes 4.9 says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Proverbs 17.17 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. But having said all that, we've got to recognize that some things are more important than making friends. And that means that sometimes following God means we've got to stand alone. In 1 Kings chapter 22, we have the story here of a prophet by the name of Micaiah and a wicked king of Israel named Ahab. Now in our story, Ahab is considering going to war and he's trying to get the king of the, of the south, the king of Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat, to go along with him. And they have an alliance. They've, they've formed an alliance. In fact, Jehoshaphat, who is a good, godly king, has married into the family of Ahab. And so they formed this alliance. And Ahab's trying to talk Jehoshaphat into uniting with him and going to war against Syria. And he wants to hear... He, uh, the, Jehoshaphat says, well, before we go to, go to war, let's hear what the Lord has to say about this thing. Now, that's the mark of a godly man. Before I make any big decision, I'm going to go to prayer. I want to hear what God has to say about this thing. I'm going to cons consult God's word. I'm going to hear from God's man before I go to war. And so he asks Ahab, can you summon some godly man, some, some godly prophet to come and to, to tell us what the Lord's will is here. And the Bible says that Ahab calls in these, these prophets, and this, this whole bunch of prophets. problem is they're false prophets. They're not true prophets. In fact, uh, Ahab and Jezebel up to this point have followed Baal, not God. And if you remember when we talked about the encounter between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, there were probably a lot of prophets out there who kind of saw the handwriting on the wall and said, you know... We're going to switch. Instead of calling ourselves prophets of Baal, we're going to call ourselves prophets of the Lord. But they haven't changed their message. And so they're no God more godly than they ever were. They're still false prophets. They're still preaching wrong things. They're being paid by the king, so they're going to tell the king exactly what he wants to hear. They're not really interested in what God's word is. And they come out and they start prophesying and they say, Oh, you need to go up to war. You will be absolutely victorious. You'll conquer. You'll do great things. This thing's going to go great. Because that's what they want to hear. 
See, he's gathered to himself a whole bunch of prophets who are going to tell him what he wants to hear. And unfortunately, that's what the world is, is doing today as well. The most popular preachers today are the ones who tell everybody what they want to hear. That you're okay. I'm okay and you're okay. And there is no such thing as sin. And sin ain't so bad and God ain't so mad. That's what people want to hear. And you fill halls, you fill auditoriums, you fill stadiums with that kind of a message today. But a godly person, a godly man or woman, a woman is going to recognize when they hear the truth. Jehoshaphat is sitting there and he's listening to all that and he says, man... This ain't God. This is a lot of things, but I recognize one thing about it. It ain't coming from the Lord. And so he looks over at Ahab and he says, Isn't there somebody around who still speaks for the Lord? The Lord? And Ahab says, Well, there's this one guy. His name is Micaiah, but I don't like him. Why not? So he never says anything good about me. He always, he always says bad things about me. I don't, don't like him. Josphat says, send for him. Send for him. Verse 8. So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring Micaiah, the son of Imlah, quickly. One man, one man is left in all of Ahab's court who is known for speaking the truth. The king hates him. The king despises him because he says bad things about the king. Well, the reason he says bad things about the king is because the king is bad. We've been studying through, uh, through this, uh, this wonderful book for about a month now, and I told you every week the Bible says Ahab was the worst king they ever had. That's why Micaiah never says anything good about it. It's not Micaiah's fault. It's Ahab's fault. Yet yeah, we live in a world today where as evangelical Christians, we're often known for being against things. And I hear people all the time say, well, pastor, I just hate that people, when they think about us as evangelicals, they think about what we are against. Well, folks, that's not our fault. When the world's going the wrong way, we have to call a sin a sin. The great evangelist Billy Sunday was criticized one time because he preached a lot against things like alcohol and alcohol use and some things that were going on in his day. Somebody came to him one day and they said, Billy, you need to change your message. You're rubbing the cat the wrong direction. And Billy said, no, I'm rubbing the fur the right direction. The cat needs to turn around. <laughs> Folks, as evangelicals, we're rubbing the fur the right way. The cat needs to turn around. We don't need to change our message. Micaiah wasn't well liked because he told the truth. God's word speaks out against wrong action. And when we obey God's truth, we won't be saying the same thing that the world says. Some say the Bible says you shouldn't judge. Well, the truth is God alone judges people. But God's word judges their actions. Micaiah was hated because he followed God, and he told others what God said. And when we speak for God and against sin, we will sometimes be criticized for that. But we need to remember, God is love. God is love. But he is also just. He is also righteous. He is also the God of truth. Verse 10, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, having put on their robes, sat on each on his throne at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah, the son of Chenah, uh, had made horns of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. 
And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. Then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them, and speak encouragement. And Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. So all the prophets are telling him, oh, things are going to go great. Things are going to go perfect. Go up there and you will absolutely destroy this, the Syrians. There's nothing going to go wrong. And this guy who's gone to get Micaiah tells him, listen, everybody, everybody is encouraging the king. So when you get in there, this is what you need to do. You need to go along with them. You need to encourage the king too. You need to tell him that everything's going to go great. Micaiah says, listen, what God says is what I say. Doesn't matter what the world says. Doesn't matter what, what the king wants to hear. What I'm going to say is what God has said. Folks, we need that kind of conviction in our lives. We're not just going to follow the crowd, even if it's convenient. We need to be committed to the truth. The truth of Almighty God. It may not make us a lot of friends, but that's okay. If God is our friend, he's all we need. Verse 15, then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And he answered him, go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand, yada, 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 whatever. He's, uh, he's mocking these other prophets. The king says, listen, what should I do? And he says, well, whatever, fine, go on. Go on, yeah, it'll be fine, I'm sure. Make your little war. And the king rolls his eyes, verse, 12, verse 16. So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Now, Ahab is a pagan. He is not a worshiper of Jehovah. He is not a follower of the one true God. He hates the messenger, but deep down, he still wants to know the truth. That's true of the world today, too. They may criticize you, they may ridicule you, they may hate you, but deep down, they still want to know what the truth is. Deep down, they will respect you if you tell the truth. If you tell the truth. Your friend is the person who tells you the truth. Not what you want to hear, but the truth. You know, don't gather to yourself people who will just tell you what you want to hear. Gather to yourself people who will tell you the truth, who will call you to task, who will hold you accountable because they love you. The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend. A friend who loves you will tell you the truth. He'll tell you when you're not doing what God says you should do. He'll tell you when your life doesn't line up. He'll call you to task when your life is not living up to what God has said it should be. That's a real friend. So how does Micaiah respond? Well, he declares his vision. Verse 17, he says, okay. You want to hear it? This is what it says. Then he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? So Micaiah stands up and he says, Okay, I'll tell you the truth. You know what God says? You're going to die. You're going to go to war and you're going to die. You ain't coming back from this. And Ahab, Ahab looks over at Jehoshaphat and he says, I told you. He never says anything good about me. He never says anything good about me. Verse 19. Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner and another spoke in that manner. And then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? 
So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Folks, if all you want to hear is lies, if all you want to hear is the word of the devil and not the word of God, eventually, eventually, God's just going to turn you over to it. Eventually, he's going to say, all right, you've had your last chance. And he's going to turn you over to the lies. And there's a lot of people out there who have gone so far, who have said so no to the Lord so many times, who have hardened their heart over and over to the truth of the gospel, that finally the Holy Spirit just gets to a point where he doesn't strive with them anymore. He turns them over to the lies they want to hear. Folks, here's the thing, though. We don't know when that time comes. So we keep telling the truth. We keep telling the truth, hoping that this person we're talking to still has one more chance. But let me tell you, if you're here this morning and you have said no to the gospel, you have said no to the preaching of the word, you've said no to the call to salvation over and over and over again, let me just point out, the Bible says there comes a day when God says, that's enough. That's enough. Today is the day of salvation. You are not guaranteed another chance. Verse 24. Now Zedekiah, the son of Chanah, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way did the Spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. So one of the false prophets comes over to him, slaps him on the cheek and says, Listen, why is the Spirit telling me one thing and telling you another? One of us is wrong here. And Micaiah says, well, you'll find out which one of us is wrong when you're hiding in a closet somewhere scared to death because the king's dead. Verse 26. So the king of Israel said, take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and water of affliction until I come in peace. But Micaiah said, and this is interesting, folks, if you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, take heed, all you people. Zedekiah claims that God has spoken through him. Micah claims that God has spoken through him. How do you know the difference? How do you know the difference? Well, he says, in that day, in that day, you know the difference because the prophet who is speaking the truth, it'll come to pass. The prophet who is a lying prophet, a false prophet, it won't come to pass. It won't come to pass. In our day and time, you just check what they're saying by the word of God. Cross-check what that preacher, that guy on TV, that guy on the radio, cross-check what he's saying with God's word and see if it matches up. Because if it doesn't match up with God's word, he is a false prophet. And folks, there are many of those. There are many of those. All you got to do is turn on the television set, and I'm going to tell you, the vast majority of them are false preachers, false prophets, teaching things that aren't true. See if it checks by the word of the Lord. Micah uses God's word. He says, listen, you want to know whether I'm the, 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 the true prophet or he is? Check it by God's word. And he references Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22, where Moses says, listen, if a guy stands up and he says he's a prophet and he says something that's not true, that does not come to pass, he's not a real prophet. He's not a real prophet. Micah says, check it by the word. Check it by God's word. If in the end, I'm, I, my, what I say doesn't come to pass... It's not God's word. It's not God's word. God's message always comes true. God never fails to do what he says he's going to do. Now, folks, I have to tell you, it's just be very careful. I hear people say this all the time. They'll say, you know, God said such and such, or God just told me that such and such was going to happen, or, or such and such was what I should do. Be very careful about that. 
Because the Bible says, if you say, God said, and it doesn't happen, you're a false prophet. You know what the Bible says about false prophets? They're worthy of death. That's some serious stuff. Be careful about putting words in God's mouth. Now, I may feel like this is God's will. I may feel like God is going to do something, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Verse 28, Micah proclaims the truth. And not just to Ahab and Jehoshaphat, he proclaims it to all the people. All the people. He says, listen, everybody, everybody listen to me. I'm going to tell you what God has said. Now, folks, we need to be willing to speak to everybody. Everybody. We need to be willing to tell the truth to everybody, great and small, the down and out and the up and out. We need to be willing to preach the gospel in season and out of season. Uh, many years ago, uh, John Wesley was uh, a uh, uh, Church of England preacher before he started the Methodist movement. And he was criticized because he preached all week long. He would go out and he would preach on Mondays and Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. And, and the Anglican church didn't like that. They came to him and said, you're only supposed to preach on Sunday morning. And he said, listen, he said, I only preach two times. And they said, really, what's that? And he said, in season and out of season. It's the only time I preach. That's what the Bible says. We should be willing to preach in season and out of season. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. No matter who you're talking to or where you are, tell the truth. Now, I'm going to warn you, being a prophet's not always going to be a fun job. You're not always going to make friends. You may even be persecuted. The Bible tells us here that the king said, take Micah, throw him in prison, and feed him with the bread of affliction. What they meant was basically he's going to be on bread and water till I get back. Throw him in prison, because I don't like what he said. And the world may not like what you say when you preach God's word. But that doesn't mean we have a license not to preach it. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are therefore ambassadors for Christ. We are his ambassadors to a lost world. Folks, when an ambassador goes from the United States to France, he does not have a license to say anything he wants to say. He says what the president says to say. When an ambassador goes from the United States to Iran, he isn't free to just make it up as he goes. He has a message that he's to bring that comes from the authority above him. We are ambassadors for Christ, and when we go to our lost and dying world around us, we have a message that is set forth for us, and that message is found in this word, and we can't vary from it. People will criticize sometimes. They'll say, Pastor, I just don't like some of the things you preach. Well, folks, I just want you to know I'm not in production. I'm in marketing. All I do is bring you the message. I didn't write it. If you don't like it, you can take that up with somebody else. But I warn you, you aren't going to get very far. God wrote this word. I just bring you what he says. Philippians 2.15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We're to be lights in a dark world, preaching truth to a lost generation. Now, how does that affect us? So practically, how does this work itself out? Well, it means that we need to be willing to be unpopular if it means standing for the truth. James 4.4 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes him an enemy of God. 1 John 2 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's easy to go along with the world. It's easy to go along just to get along. It's easy to try to be friends with the world. It's harder to decide, I'm going to be a friend of God rather than the world. And that means, folks, that we're going to have to stand for truth. That means that we're going to preach the gospel. The way of salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. 
By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you'll be saved. There is no other name given amongst men by which you must be saved except Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, the life, the Bible says. No man comes to the Father except by me. That's our message. That's what we preach. The Bible says we must repent of sin. That means we call sin, sin. It means that we live differently from the world. It means that we are going to be more honest in our business dealings than perhaps the rest of the world would prefer that we be. It means that we are going to be more pure in our speech, in our language, than maybe our friends and our neighbors would like for us to be. It means that we, we, we're going to look at people in a different way. We're going to love people like Jesus loved people, and we're not going to respect some of the boundaries and differences that the world imposes upon us. It means we're going to love people no matter what the color of their skin is. We're going to love them no matter what kind of money they make or where they live or what they talk like. We're going to love people like Jesus did. And we're going to tell people about Christ. We're going to live the Word of God. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. It's time that Christians purposed in their heart that they will not defile themselves, that they're going to be friends with God rather than with the world. And that may mean that I lose a few friends at work, that I lose a few friends at school. It may mean that I lose my boyfriend, my girlfriend. That's okay. If God is my friend, that's all I need. That's all I need. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Noah was in the minority when he went in the ark, but he was in the majority when he came out. You want to be God's friend. You want to be God's friend. You know what my objective is when I die? When I die, I want to be able for the, the preacher who preaches my funeral to stand up and say, he was a friend of God. He was God's friend. That's enough. That's enough for me. Let me ask you something. Can you say that today? That you are God's friend. That you have... Recognize that you are a sinner, lost and undone by breaking God's laws. And you have repented of your sin, turned from your sin, and asked Jesus to save you? Have you realized that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins? The Bible says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved and no one will be turned away. All you have to do is believe. Turn from your sin and give your life now to Christ and his service. It's not a one-time thing, folks. It is something that, that you will do for the rest of your life. You give your life to Jesus, not just this minute, your whole life. Are you willing to do that right now? If you are, the Bible says, you can be God's friend. More than that, you can be a part of God's own family, one of his own adopted children this very morning. If you'll receive the free gift of salvation that Christ offers. In just a moment, I'm going to be standing here at the front. We're going to sing a little hymn. If you, if you have come to this point this morning where you realize that you are a sinner, you, that you need Christ as your Savior, and you're willing to give your life to him and his service right now, believing that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, I'll be standing here at the front. You can come to me and say, Pastor, I believe, and I'll show you what your next step as a believer in Christ needs to be. Maybe you're here this morning, you're a believer in Christ already, but you've been tempted to compromise. Maybe you have compromised a lot, and now you realize that you need to stand for the truth. You need to make some changes to your attitude, to the way you behave, to the way you speak. You need to make some changes. This time of invitation is for you to ask the Lord, convict me now, Lord, of where I've come short as a believer in Christ. Convict me of where I have failed to live up to the truth that I might walk with Christ and honor you before a lost and dying world. During this time of invitation, do that. Maybe you're here this morning, you know Christ your Savior, but you need a church home, a place where people will love you, care about you, a place where they believe the Word of God, where the Word of God is preached faithfully, and the Holy Spirit is just laid upon your heart. 
Hill, uh, East Side Baptist Church is where you need to be. You need to put your, your family here, be part of our family. We'll receive you as a Baptist church receives members this morning. But let's be obedient during this time of invitation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would move in power upon, upon this congregation and upon these hearts this morning. For those that do not know Christ, draw them to salvation today that you might be glorified. For those that do know Christ, we ask, Lord, that you would convict us of our shortcomings, that we would live according to the truth, that we'd be different than the world. Because, Lord, we know we're not going to change the world by being the same as it. Lord, we need to be different. Convict us of our shortcomings. Draw us closer to you, Lord. Straighten us out. 